home that makes it. This is the largest crowd we ever had. And let me tell you something. If I had known that um, Dr. was going to be talking about this topic, I would have shown up too whether I had to be here or not because this is, this is what's happening now. You know how they talk about state-of-the-art equipment? This is state-of-the-art knowledge. We all think that vitamin D is a vitamin, but today you're going to learn a lot differently. So um, I see Dr. Zaidi way back there, and I'm going to call him up here so I can introduce him to you. He's a very relaxed, casual guy. As you can tell, he's carrying his coffee. And if you would please join me, he does not need any introduction. You will hear the fabulous information from him. So please put your hand together and welcome him. Good morning and welcome everyone. I truly appreciate each one of you showing up this morning. You had to get up early in the morning, so did I. I know it's hard. <laughs> and as I was walking through the parking lot, I just thought, this is the best time of the day to be here. <laughs> and I was telling my wife, honey, go ahead, do as much shopping as you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited. Today we're going to talk about uh, vitamin D deficiency, the miraculous health benefits of vitamin D. And at the end of the talk, please feel free to ask questions. I love when you ask questions. That way I know that I was able to give you something. So, uh, uh, vitamin D actually uh, has been kind of like a hidden disease, but in the last 20 years, we have rediscovered it. So let's talk about vitamin D. First of all, I'm going to talk about some of the misconceptions about vitamin D. Have you guys heard any one of these? Your vitamin D level will be okay if you live in a place like uh, California. It will be good. If you uh, drink milk every day, it will be good if you go outdoor 15 minutes a day, eat fish, eat vegetables, take multivitamin, take a calcium pill with vitamin D, or if you are pregnant, take a prenatal vitamin, and your vitamin D will be okay. Well, guess what? These are misconceptions. Your vitamin D will not be okay. Let me share with you my own journey of understanding vitamin D. It was about 10-15 uh, years ago. I was uh, in a medical conference in Boston area. And I remember this uh, old professor giving a wonderful talk. And he made a very clear point that vitamin D deficiency is a whole lot more common than we physician think. So on my way back, I started thinking about it. And I had a lot of time to think about it. It was five hours flight. So I was thinking, how about people uh, right here in Thousand Oaks, my own patients? Do they have enough vitamin D or are they low in vitamin D? So of course, there was only one way to find out. So from next day onward, I started checking vitamin D level in each and every one of my patients. Those of you who are sitting here, my patients, you know that. And was I in for a big surprise? Almost 90% of my patients turn out to be low in vitamin D. Now that's a fact. And these patients, these people, uh, they live right here in sunny California. They take multivitamin, they are very active people, they go outdoor playing golf, playing tennis, you know, Southern life, uh, lifestyle of Southern California. And they are very active, and they are 
eating fish, uh, they are taking multivitamin, and almost all of them are still low in vitamin D. And here is the biggest misconception about vitamin D. Vitamin D is not a vitamin, it's a hormone. And we physicians have known it for over 30 years, but we just keep calling it vitamin D. I guess the old habits are difficult to change. It's not a vitamin, it's a hormone. And what is a hormone? Hormone is a chemical that is produced in one part of your body, it gets in blood circulation, goes to various parts of the body and have its action. For example, thyroid hormone, produced by thyroid gland right here in your neck, goes in blood circulation and has its effect on almost every organ in the body. Same way insulin, it gets produced by pancreas, gets in the blood circulation and has its effects on almost every tissue in the body. Same way, hormone D gets produced by the skin upon exposure to sun, gets in blood circulation, and has its effects on almost every organ system in the body. And here is the irony. When you have thyroid deficiency, we call it hypothyroidism. When you have insulin deficiency, we call it diabetes. Doesn't it make sense if you have hormone D deficiency, we call it hormone D deficiency, right? And that's what I've started calling it, HDD, hormone D deficiency. So please, from today onward, remember the phrase HDD, hormone D deficiency. And that's what we're going to talk about. Sorry, in, in my rest of the talk, I'll try to refer to it as hormone D, okay? If once in a while I go back to vitamin D, it's my old habits. So how common is HDD? It is probably the most common disease affecting mankind today. In this country alone, estimates are that more than 200 million people suffer from this disease. That's two-thirds of the population. And worldwide, billions of people are suffering from this disease. It is present in every part of the world. Even if you live in a sunny place, you have it. There are reports from Australia, New Zealand, from India, from Middle East, from all around the world, people are suffering from hormone D deficiency. It spares no race. Whatever ethnic background you have, you're going to have this disease. It spares no gender, and it spares no age. Children have it, grown-ups have it, elderly have it. So what is uh, HDD? Hormone D deficiency has various manifestations. Why? Because it is a hormone. It goes out in the blood circulation and affects every system in the body. So when you are growing this important hormone, you're going to have a multitude of symptoms. And here are some of them. Chronic fatigue, chronic body aches and pains. How many of you have it? Raise your hand, please. Chronic ache, body muscle aches, chronic fatigue. Probably that is the most common symptom of this disease. Osteoporosis, fractures, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, flu, even swine flu, common cold, other infections, a lot of autoimmune diseases such as asthma, multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which causes underactive thyroid, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, degenerative arthritis, lupus, 
fibromyalgia, even depression, even memory loss. How many of you have that? I do. Thank you. Good one. Even dental fractures, even gingivitis, gum disease. In pregnant ladies, there is a condition called preeclampsia. It's a pretty uh, uh, horrible disease. Gestational diabetes, low birth weight in newborn babies, and another pretty terrible disease called soft skull bones in the newborn babies. So let's start with the chronic fatigue, aches, and body pains. As it turns out, hormone D has receptors on muscles, joints, and bones. So obviously, hormone D is very important for the health of muscles, bones, and joints. And when you are low in hormone D, then you suffer from body aches, muscle aches, arthritis, and when you are hurting all over, obviously you have chronic fatigue. You don't feel like doing anything. So here's a case study from my practice. This lady was uh, 61 years old when she came to see me. She was having these generalized body aches and pains for years. So she saw a family physician who sent her to a very prestigious clinic, I would not name that. And they told her that she had elevated parathyroid hormone level. And they advised her to undergo parathyroid surgery. Now parathyroids are gland right here in your neck. So she underwent that parathyroid surgery, but it did not take care of her chronic fatigue and body aches. So when she came to see me, I still remember what she told me. And I've written it here. It hurt all over dog. The kind of pain that never goes away, it's deep in my bones. Nothing has helped, not even parathyroid surgery. I don't think I'm gonna make it. So, first thing I did was check her vitamin D level that nobody had done. And as it turned out, it was very low. I put her on the right dose of vitamin D, and within two, three months, all of her body aches and pain simply went away. Obviously, she's a big believer in hormone D now. How about osteoporosis and osteopenia? Just for curiosity, how many of you have it? Thank you. As it turns out, hormone D is extremely important for the health of bones. It does so through several mechanisms. As most of you know, hormone D is important for the absorption of calcium. But another thing you may or may not know, hormone D has receptors on the bone. So independent of calcium, hormone D affects the health of the bone. That's why when it comes to the health of the bone, hormone D is number one thing we have to take care of. So anyone who is having osteoporosis, osteopenia, make sure you are on a good dose of vitamin D. And only then you can be on anti-osteoporosis drugs. Actually, anti-osteoporosis drugs like Fosomax, Actomel, they don't work as well if you are low in vitamin D. So here's a case study. This lady was uh, 62 years old. She came to see me for a number of symptoms. One of the symptoms was foot cramps. So she had her bone density done, and she had a T-score of minus 2.2 at her spine, and minus 1.7 at her hip. These numbers get in the uh, diagnosis of osteopenia, which is early osteoporosis. So I put her on a good dose of vitamin D, and three years later, we repeated her bone density, and her numbers were minus 1.2 at her 
spine and minus 1.4 at her hip. There was a 13% increase in her bone density at the spine and 5% increase in the bone density at the hip. Now these are the kind of results that you can submit to FDA for the approval of a drug. I mean, these are remarkable results just with vitamin D. Of course, she was thrilled to have these kind of results just with vitamin D, and her foot cramps also went away. Okay, we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk about cancer and hormone D deficiency. I'm gonna give you a little overview uh, how cancer develops in a very simple language. In our body, cells are continuously being born and continuously dying. In the last 15 minutes or so that we've been here, millions of our cells have died and millions of new cells have born. So there's a continuous cycle of death and birth in the body. Now what happened, hormone D is very important in controlling the death of cells. And there's another hormone in the body called insulin that is important for the growth of cells. Now, what happens if you are low in vitamin D, obviously less number of cells will die. And if you are high in insulin, you're gonna have increase in the number of cells. And overall, if less number of cells are dying and more cells are being born, you're gonna have a huge increase in the number of cells, right? That's exactly what, it ha what happens in cancer. There's a huge number of abnormal cells, which we call cancer cells, so that is the basis of cancer. And as it turns out, there are two most important factors that I can call promote growth of cancer. One of them is hormone D deficiency, because when you are low in hormone D, the killing of cancer cells goes down. And when you are high in insulin, there is increased number of cancer cells. So you can consider hormone D as a chemotherapy agent without any side effects. Is there some evidence that there is a link between hormone D deficiency and cancer? Oh, you bet. A huge number of studies have shown a clear link between hormone D deficiency and cancer. And as of 2006, there have been 30 studies on colon cancer alone, 13 studies on breast cancer, 26 studies on prostate cancer, and seven studies on ovarian cancer. Each one of them showing that hormone D deficiency is linked to a high risk for cancer. So here's the case study from my practice. This nice gentleman was diagnosed with colon cancer. At the time of diagnosis, his cancer had spread to liver and prognosis was very poor. So he came to see me. I evaluated him for hormone D deficiency and insulin resistance syndrome. As it turned out, he had both of them. His hormone D level was 20, which is very low. He also had abdominal obesity, low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, high insulin level, and these are all the features of insulin resistance syndrome. While his oncologist treated him with chemotherapy, I treated him for his hormone D deficiency and for his insulin resistance syndrome. Three years later, he's alive, doing well. So let's talk about hormone D deficiency and heart disease. As it turns out, Hormone D deficiency causes an increased risk for heart disease. In 2008, two great studies came out and each one of them showed that there was a direct link between hormone D deficiency and heart disease. 
first of this study was published in uh, Circulation, which is the official journal of American Heart Association. In this study, researchers followed about 1,800 patients for the development of heart disease. And the mean follow-up was 5.4 years. Now, that's the kind of follow-up you want to see. And they found that there was a two-fold increase in the risk for heart disease in people who have hormone deficiency. In the second study, researchers found, and this research was from uh, uh, Harvard Medical School, researchers found that men who had hormone D level less than 30 had twofold increased risk for having heart attack. Or in other words, men who had a good level of vitamin D, above 30, had 50% reduction in the risk for having heart disease. Now compare that to Zocor, for example, it cuts down your risk by 30%, whereas hormone D reduces your risk by 50% and doesn't have any side effects. So how does uh, such a simple thing as uh, vitamin D can prevent heart disease? Most people kind of go skeptical. It's like, is it some kind of snake oil or this and that? It's not. Why? Because it's not a vitamin. It's a hormone. There have been a lot of research looking into this, the mechanism, how hormone D can prevent heart disease. And a wonderful study came out from Stanford and these researchers showed that vitamin D prevents uptake of cholesterol into your coronary arteries. So hormone D prevents the deposition of cholesterol in the coronary arteries. There, are, there is almost nothing else out there that does it. To completely block the uptake of cholesterol getting into what we call plaque. And another thing hormone D does, it reduces insulin resistance. So all of those who are diabetics, the main reason you develop heart disease is through insulin resistance. And hormone D takes care of your insulin resistance and it reduces your risk for having heart disease. Hormone D also lowers blood pressure, which is good for the heart. So what is my experience? Uh, being an endocrinologist, I see a lot of diabetics. Many of you are sitting right here. Some are standing. Some are standing. <laughs> I'm standing too. Thank you. And uh, over the years, I've been taking care of uh, their vitamin D deficiency and also treating their insulin resistance very aggressively. And what I've seen in my patients, there are hardly any patients who have heart problems. Whereas in general, diabetics are at very high risk for having heart disease. It's about fourfold increased risk for having heart disease if you have diabetes, but not in my patients. And it's mainly due to taking care of their hormone D deficiency and taking care of their insulin resistance syndrome. So let's talk about uh, type 2 diabetes a little more. Is there any connection between hormone D deficiency and type 2 diabetes? Yes, there is. The main cause for type 2 diabetes is what we call insulin resistance. What is insulin resistance? that your own body become kind of resistant to the action of your own insulin. So as a compensation, your body starts producing more and more insulin. But over a period of time, body cannot keep up with this huge demand of producing insulin, and at some point your insulin production goes down and you develop diabetes. Now, as it turns out, hormone D 
directly acts on muscles and fat cells and reduces your insulin resistance. Hormone B also acts on pancreas and help you to produce more insulin. Hormone B also reduces inflammation, which is very prevalent in people who have type 2 diabetes. So through these mechanisms, it makes perfect sense that if somebody is low in vitamin D, that person will be at very high risk for developing type 2 diabetes. As it turns out, that really is the case. There have been several studies which have found that people who have type 2 diabetes are very low in hormone D. One such study came from this country and these investigators looked at vitamin D level, prevalence of insulin resistance, and risk for developing type 2 diabetes. And they found out that people who had low level of vitamin D were at very high risk for developing insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So can hormone D prevent type 2 diabetes? And the answer is yes. In a great study from Finland, researchers collected health data in men and women between the ages of 40 to 74. And none of these individuals had diabetes to start with. And then they followed these individuals for 22 years. Now this is the kind of study you want to look at. 22 years of follow-up. And they found that people who had low level of hormone D were clearly at very high risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Another great study came from this country. In this study, researchers were amazed to see that hormone D can prevent progression from pre-diabetes to diabetes. Before you develop diabetes, you go through a phase of pre-diabetes. And hormone D was able to stop the progression of diabetes. And there are other mechanisms, other uh, measures that you can do to prevent this progression. One of them is diet, the other is intensive exercise. Another one that has been shown to prevent this progression is drug called metformin. And guess what? Vitamin D was as effective as metformin in preventing this progression. And of course, vitamin D is not a drug, no side effects. But it did not get any publicity, of course. How about type 1 diabetes? Type 1 diabetes is the one that we see in children, basically. It is an autoimmune disease. What is an autoimmune disease? That your own, that your own immune system goes haywire and you start attacking your own uh, cells. And when it starts attacking your insulin producing cells, it pretty much destroys all of your insulin producing cells and you develop diabetes. So the main problem with type 1 diabetes is immune system. Not functioning right, just going haywire. As it turns out, hormone B plays a very important role in the normal functioning of your immune system. So, the obvious question was that researchers thought that could vitamin D deficiency be responsible for autoimmune dysfunction and development of type 1 diabetes? So there was a study recently published in uh, Journal of Pediatrics. This study comes from famous Diabetes Institute, Jocelyn Medical Center. And they found that the vast majority of their type 1 diabetic patients were low in vitamin D. In my practice, 
I check vitamin D level in each and every one of my type 1 diabetic patients and everyone is low in hormone B. And this is my favorite uh, study. Please pay attention. This study comes from Finland. This study began in 1966 when a total of nearly 11,000 children born in 1966 in Finland were enrolled in the study. At that time in Finland, the recommended dose for vitamin D was 2,000 units every day, starting from your day one. So 2,000 units a day for infants every day. And then they followed these uh, children over the next 31 years. Now that's the kind of follow-up you want to see. 31 years of follow-up. And they were looking at how many of these children ultimately developed type 1 diabetes. They found out that those children who received vitamin D 2,000 units a day during their first year of life had an 80% reduction in the risk for developing type 1 diabetes. There is nothing else out there that has this kind of prevention. And did vitamin D get any recognition? Did you hear it on TV? Of course not. And this study was published 10 years ago. And many diabetologists even don't know about it. So this is the power of vitamin D. And here are some other interesting facts. In 1975, in Finland, they reduced the recommended dose of vitamin D from 2,000 to 1,000 units per day. And then in 1992, they reduced it further to 400 units a day. And guess what happened? In the last two, three decades, there have been a huge increase in the number of type 1 diabetics in Finland. Why did they reduce this dose? I looked into that. There was no toxicity. Just simple uh, observation that vitamin D, uh, which is present in one tablespoon of uh, cod liver oil, is 400 units. And that was considered to be safe and effective in preventing rickets. Yes, that's all it does. But it does not prevent diabetes. And by the way, for comparison, in the U.S., the recommended dose for uh, children has been only 200 units a day. How about some of the other autoimmune diseases and role of hormone D deficiency? Hormone D deficiency plays a significant role in causing each and every autoimmune disease. And here are some examples. Asthma multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. <coughs> About asthma and hormone D deficiency, there are a lot of research going on and here's the interesting thing that asthma has increased in its prevalence remarkably in the last three decades. And so has vitamin D deficiency. So asthma ex experts, they believe that this increase in asthma incidence is directly related to increase in hormone D deficiency. Very sound medical research shows that a good level of vitamin D is important for the normal growth of immune system as well as lungs during your in utero development. When a mother is low in vitamin D, so is the infant. And obviously, it affects their immune system and maturity of lungs, uh, lungs in general. And that's the reason these children are at very high risk for having asthma later on. In addition, 
Children who are low in vitamin D, they are also at high risk for having upper respiratory infections, which trigger wheezing and asthma episodes. In asthma, sometimes patients become resistant to any treatment, including steroids. And in these patients, hormone D works as an adjunct. Hormone D given in high doses make this patient respond better to steroids. How about hormone D deficiency and MS? This is very exciting. As uh, you may or may not know, MS is a crippling disease. For many years, investigators knew that MS occurs much more frequently in northern areas, like northern European countries, Canada, northeastern United States. So obviously they started thinking, is there some correlation between hormone D deficiency and MS? And this ultimately resulted in this wonderful studies in experimental animals. And these studies come from Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. The researchers found that by giving hormone D supplementation, they were able to prevent completely development of MS in the animal model. I mean, this is outstanding. They also showed that hormone D can prevent progression of MS. Even you have developed MS, hormone D can prevent further progression. So these MS experts now recommend vitamin D to be a natural inhibitor of MS. Everyone who has MS must go on a high dose of hormone D. Those who are genetically predisposed to MS, like kins uh, to anyone who has MS, must also go on a very high dose of vitamin D. It can prevent development of, of MS. I have a patient, I didn't include here, uh, she had MS for about 15-20 uh, years. She was on all kind of uh, therapies for MS, came to see me about a year ago, her MS was getting worse, but she came to see me for her underactive thyroid. I just checked her vitamin D level, as I do in every one of you. As it turned out, her vitamin D level was very low. So I treated her hormone D deficiency. A year later, she had her MRI done. For the first time in 15 years, her MS lesions have regressed, have improved. Everyone including herself, me, and her MS specialist, we were thrilled to see that kind of result, just with MS, just with hormone D alone. And now she has come off one of her MS medications, and she's very thrilled. How about uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, degenerative arthritis? Hormone D plays a positive role in all of these conditions. How about high blood pressure and hormone D deficiency? Is there a relationship between the two? Yes, there is. Hypertension develops because there is a hormone in the body called renin. It's produced by kidneys. Renin acts on another hormone called angiotensin. And then this angiotensin causes increase in blood pressure. Guess what? Hormone D reduces renin, and by reducing renin, it reduces the whole system of renin angiotensin. And by doing so, it reduces your blood pressure. So, any one of you on blood pressure medicines? Thank you. Make sure you also have a good level of vitamin D, because vitamin D is an antihypertensive medication without any side effects. How about depression and memory loss? There are several studies out now which show that people who have depression, people who have memory loss, they have very low vitamin D level. And by giving them a good dose of vitamin D can improve their depression and even their memory loss. A lot of studies are in progress right now. So how do we diagnose this 
disease called HDD or hormone D deficiency. It's only a simple blood test. But then there are a lot of pitfalls, as we're going to talk about. Labs offer a two blood tests for hormone D deficiency. One of them is the right test, and the other one is the wrong test to diagnose vitamin D deficiency. So please pay attention. It's in your handout. The right blood test to diagnose vitamin D deficiency is 25 OH vitamin D. The wrong test to diagnose vitamin D deficiency is 125 dihydroxyvitamin D. There are two reasons why 25 hydroxy is the right test and 125 dihydroxy is the wrong test. Reason number one 25 hydroxy vitamin D has a much longer half life compared to 125 dihydroxy which has a very short half-life. So 25 hydroxy vitamin D truly reflects overall vitamin D level in your body over a period of days and weeks. Reason number two. Vitamin D is closely related to another hormone in the body called parathyroid hormone. So when you are low in vitamin D, Parathyroid hormones go in high gear. So this high level of parathyroid hormone then causes conversion from 25 hydroxy to 125 hydroxy vitamin D. So as a result, your 125 by hydroxy vitamin D remains normal because there is a high production of this hormone because of high level of parathyroid hormone. So a person may be low in vitamin D but their 125 dihydroxy vitamin D will be normal. And here's a real case study. This lady was uh, 63 years old when she came to see me. Uh, her other physician had ordered her vitamin D testing, and this physician had included both the tests, 125 dihydroxy as well as 25 hydroxy vitamin D. As it turned out, her 125 dihydroxy vitamin D level was high, not only normal, high, it was 72. And her 25 hydroxy vitamin D level was only 5, which is very, very low. So we, we did her parathyroid uh, level, and that turned out to be extremely high. So now can you imagine if this lady had done only 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which was high, her physician would have told her that your vitamin D level is good. It's not only good, it's high. So don't take any vitamin D, right? Whereas, in fact, she was very low in vitamin D. So please remember, I see this mistake all the time. When your physician orders your vitamin D, make sure it is 25 hydroxy vitamin D and not 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Here's another pitfall in the inter interpretation of the test. Physicians usually interpret a test by looking at the normal range. And so do all of you, right? You get a copy of your test, you look at the normal range. If it is in the range, you say, oh, this is fine, right? As it turns out, the normal ranges for vitamin D are outdated and inaccurate. These ranges come from the era when our only concern was to prevent rickets. So a very small dose of vitamin D will prevent rickets. That's why those ranges are as low as 10. Yes, if you are close to 10, you will not develop rickets, but you will develop diabetes and all the other conditions that we have discussed. So the lower limit of uh, vitamin D, 25 hydroxy vitamin D test, should be at least 30 nanogram per ml. And preferably, it should be 50 nanogram per ml. 
Here's another pitfall. Most of the physicians, they are in the habit of just looking at the numbers and not looking at the units. As it turns out, vitamin D is reported in one of the two units. One kind of units are what we call nanogram per ml and the other units are nanomole per liter. And the conversion factor is 2.5. For example, if your level is 30 nanogram per ml, you multiply it with 2.5 and you get a number 75 in nanomole per liter. So the lower limit for 25 hydroxy vitamin D should be 30 nanogram per ml, which is equal to 75 nanomole per liter. Now let's see what happens, uh, and it happens all the time. Your physician saw your blood level of 25 vitamin D, and it was 40 nanomole per liter. If he or she did not pay attention to the unit, and just looked at the number 40, he or she will say, oh, you are very good in vitamin D. Whereas 40 nanomole per liter turns out to be 16 nanogram per ml and 16 nanogram per ml is very low level of vitamin D. So please, pay attention to the units of vitamin D. So this is the accurate normal range for vitamin D test. It should be 30 to 100 nanogram per ml or 75 to 250 nanomole per liter. So let's talk about uh, treatment of hormone D deficiency. <laughs> Natural sources of, white, of hormone D are only two. The major source is sun. Normally we receive about 90% of our vitamin D from sun. Food sources are very minor source of vitamin D and it accounts for only about 10% of vitamin D that we get. So can we get enough vitamin D from sun? We can. And let me share this story with you. Over the years that I've been testing vitamin D in all of my patients, there was one patient who had a good level of vitamin D without any supplementation. So obviously I asked her, what is she doing? She told me, any guess what she was doing? Sunbathing, sun tanning. Anyone else? Very good. Like sunbathing. She was a lifeguard at Ventura Beach. So how many of you have that kind of lifestyle? <laughs> Thank you. So that much sun exposure you need with hardly any clothes on to get a good level of vitamin D, okay? Not 15 minutes a day going out in your regular clothes. No, that won't do it. And even to that lady I told that with that kind of sun exposure, she is at a high risk for having skin cancer, okay? How about foods? As I talk, foods are a very minor source of vitamin D. Now look at these numbers. I've given you some numbers uh, like salmon. You take three ounces of uh, salmon, it gives you about 300 units of vitamin D, which is a minuscule amount. I mean, when we are talking thousands of vitamin D, I mean, these 300 units is nothing. I'm amazed to hear that uh, uh, some experts are recommending uh, taking vegetables to get vitamin D. Absolutely inaccurate. Vegetables have almost no amount of vitamin D in them. So from a practical standpoint, vitamin D supplement is your solution. You, we cannot change our lifestyle, we cannot just all be lifeguards. So uh, 
and we cannot get enough from foods. So the real practical solution is take a good dose of vitamin D supplement. Uh, a question frequently people ask me, how much? And here's the problem. I cannot give the answer. Why? Because when it comes to vitamin D, one size fits all does not work. Everyone has a different requirement for vitamin D. So in my patients over the years, what I've seen that the range is from anywhere 2,000 units a day to 12,000 units a day. So now you can see I cannot tell this uh, it takes uh, uh, so many thousands of units. I can't. And no one can really. Scientifically speaking, everyone has a different requirement of vitamin D. You can see the wide range anywhere from 2,000 to 12,000 units a day. And in my book, I've given a table, and that's a good guide. You should have your vitamin D level checked, and from there, uh, you can start out on a dose that I've given in the table, and go from there. How about vitamin D toxicity? Any article you read, uh, they make it sound like vitamin D toxicity is so common and you have to be extremely careful. Sometimes patients come and they tell me they don't want to take vitamin D because it is very toxic. Guess what? All of these people who are writing those articles, I'm positive that they are not treating patients. Because here's the reality. I've been treating patients with vitamin D deficiency for the last 10 years. I must have treated thousands of patients with high doses of vitamin D and none of these patients have developed vitamin D toxicity. Now that is reality based on real experience. So in summary, hormone D deficiency is the most common disease affecting mankind today. Hormone D, when taken at a good level, it can prevent as well as it can be extremely helpful in the treatment of a number of diseases as we talked. Chronic fatigue, arthritis, cancer, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, osteoporosis, memory loss, depression, flu, swine flu, common cold, you name it. Vitamin D has a beneficial effect. There is no other vitamin, herb, or drug that has as many health benefits as vitamin D does, and without any toxicity. So take charge of your hormone D deficiency today. And remember, don't call it hormone D deficiency, HDD. Thank you very much. Doctor will be doing Q&A, so if you can stay just a second, we'll, we'll take a few, but let me make some um, announcements. Um, La Shrobley's Hospital that sponsors this um, cannot endorse any books that any doctors write. However, I do want you to know that Dr. Zadi's book is in the back for sale for $17. That includes tax. You can also buy it on Amazon.com. It's called The Power of Vitamin D. Um, also, if you did not get a handout and would like it, please call me at the hospital. If you have a moment to write my telephone number down, you can do that. I'll share that with you. Or call Los Robles Hospital and ask for Chris in the marketing department. He'll put you through, leave your name and address, and I'll send one to you or your email address, and I'll email it to you. My direct line is 805-370-470. 4464. This is the largest crowd we ever had, and it warms my heart because it tells me that you're out there and wanting to take care of your health. So let's take a few questions. Doctor, when, when they ask a question, if you could repeat it. Oh, sure. Okay, thank you. Speak loudly. Uh, yes, ma'am. The question is, uh, what about myasthenia gravis and hormone D deficiency? Uh, it's a very good question. 
I'm not aware of any studies in that area yet, but I'm sure people are looking into it. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease, and I will predict that hormone D should play a significant role. Yes. You were saying. I take 2,000 a day. Is it okay to take, take it by itself, or can you take it with all your other vitamins? Okay, the question is that she takes vitamin D 2,000 units a day. Should she take it by itself, or can she take it with other vitamins? You can take it with other vitamins, no problem. Vitamin D2, and D2 a very good question. Vitamin, vitamin D2 versus vitamin D3, which one is better? Here it is. I'm talking about mainly vitamin D3. Uh, vitamin D2 comes from plants. Vitamin D3 comes from sun and also from salmon, from fish. So mostly it is vitamin D3 that you should take. Yes, I am. Yes. Yeah. Is there a quality that's better uh, if I buy it at Whole Foods versus Trader Joe's or any other place? Uh, probably there is because it has become a huge market and all kinds of people are jumping in it. Uh, so go with somebody who is a good manufacturer. I got it from Whole Foods. It's 5000 It should be okay. Yes. Do you know any substance or chemical molecule which affect uptake of vitamin D? Uh, no, no it wouldn't because that kind of uh, thinking comes from uh, looking at vitamin D as vitamin. No, vitamin D is not a vitamin. What's it's the a question? Hormone. What's the question? So, uh, What's the question? The, the, the question is, uh, do I know of some molecule or something that will help increase the uptake of uh, vitamin D? No, there isn't. Naturally, it is produced in the skin, gets in blood circulation, goes to liver, kidneys, and affects every system in the body. It's not a vitamin. The, the whole confusion comes when we think of D as vitamin. D is not a vitamin. It's a hormone. What is the ingredient in the vitamin I mean, in the uh, vitamin D pill? The, the ingredient in most of them is uh, vitamin D3. It's a chemical formula. Where, where are they getting it from? Is that the question? They're getting it usually from fish or from a skin, goat skin. It's coming from New Zealand. I can't hear you. She wants to know how to find a good source of D3. Yeah. How to get a good uh, manufacturer of vitamin D? Well, I know one of them is called uh, Now Foods. Nowfoods.com. Oh, you're welcome. But generally, once one starts taking a hormone D supplement, how generally how long is it before you start seeing the effects of it? Is it a month, two months? The question is, once you start uh, taking hormone D, how long does it take before you start seeing the effects? Uh, it's usually a matter of just a couple of weeks, at the most couple of months. And uh, I've seen people, their fatigue and muscle aches and bone pain, they just disappear like that within a couple of months. Okay. Naturally, in mother's milk, you know, and so would breastfeeding be the foremost form of providing vitamin D to Okay, very good question. Uh, how about the uh, level of uh, hormone D in breast milk? As it turns out, it's very, very low. And uh, so, uh, and that is a reflection of hormone D deficiency in, in the mother herself. So, here is my advice to, uh, we didn't have time to go into detail about pregnancy and hormone D deficiency. I've discussed it in detail in my book. 
if you are pregnant or if you are planning to get pregnant, make sure before you get pregnant, you have a good level of hormone D because uh, your fetus is going to depend on your vitamin D because hormone D, it crosses placenta, it gets into a fetus and right from day one, every development of any tissue in the fetus is going to be dependent in part on a good level of vitamin D. As it turns out, especially immune system, bones, and uh, who knows what else. These two systems we know very well, immune system and bones. And as it turns out, uh, newborn who have their mother uh, vitamin D being low, those newborns have low vitamin D level. And they suffer from all kinds of diseases. Uh, you may or may not know, right in this country, uh, still there is rickets. So there have been studies even from Texas, from Massachusetts, from uh, Alaska, uh, that uh, rickets is happening again because uh, their mothers are extremely low in vitamin D and then they breastfeed, which has almost no vitamin D, and these children are developing rickets. So every infant uh, should have a good level of vitamin D, and you can easily give them 1,000 units a day. As you, as you saw in my, one of the studies I quoted, they were giving 2,000 units a day in Finland, and they were able to prevent type 1 diabetes. I mean, it's extremely, extremely safe. Where would you find out what you said um, drugs, some drugs that people might be taking uh, interfere with the absorption of vitamin D? Okay, good question. Uh, that what are the drugs that can interfere with the absorption of vitamin D? It's in my book, and here are some big ones. Steroids. Whenever you take steroids, your vitamin D level is going to go down. So, whenever anyone puts you on any kind of steroid, make sure you double your dose of vitamin D because they won't do it to you. You have to do it yourself. Okay? Some of the other uh, drugs that interfere with the absorption are dilantin. And uh, Xanipel, that is a uh, uh, weight reducing uh, medicine some people take. Uh, those are the main ones. Antidepressant and uh, cholesterol pills. Dilantin, uh, sorry, antidepression and cholesterol pill, no, they don't interfere, except for Zetia. Zetia uh, is one of the cholesterol lowering medicine that work by preventing absorption of fat from the intestines. So that could potentially interfere with the absorption, yes. Very good question. How often should we have a hormone D level check? Every three months. Because it does fluctuate. And I've seen that in my patients. Uh, depending upon weather, like you know, we still go out sometime during winter time. Uh, over here, you have a week of, it feels like summer. And during summertime, people do go out. So it does fluctuate how much you get from sun. So it's, it's a very good idea to have it checked every three months. How much do you get from the average? So you mentioned about 300 international units of salmon. If you want to have an hour, what are you talking about? How much is that? Okay, the question is uh, basically how much uh, vitamin D you can uh, synthesize in the skin when you go out in the sun? Uh, Extremely, extremely variable uh, because uh, here are the variables that control how much vitamin D you can synthesize in the skin upon exposure to sun. Uh, number one, where do you live? The latitude. Number two, time of the day. Uh, the sun rays are very effective in producing vitamin D between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Of course, season winter versus summer. Color of the skin. In the skin there is a, a pigment called melanin that gives rise to uh, color of the skin. 
but this melanin also works as sunscreen. It blocks all the synthesis of vitamin D. So a person like me has to be out in the sun for 10 hours compared to my wife who is fair skinned and she would be there half an hour. She would make the same amount of vitamin D as I would. Okay. And a person who is even darker skinned than me will have even less an amount of vitamin D. Uh, your age, as you grow older, your ability to form vitamin D goes down by about, you're down to like about 25% compared to a young person. So with so many variables, really nobody can ever tell you how much vitamin D you're gonna synthesize. And that's why I'm so surprised when I hear these kind of comments, go outdoor 15 minutes a day and you'll have enough vitamin D. What are you talking? For example, you are in Boston, okay? And there are two people there. One is 25 years old, the other is 75 years old. With the same amount of sun exposure, they're gonna form different level of vitamin D. Now, and there's an African American, there's a Caucasian, they're gonna form different level of vitamin D. There's so many variables, and when I see this kind of blanket statements, it, it really, that's one reason I wrote this book, because of these kind of misconceptions. So your best bet really is have your vitamin D level checked. That factors in all the variables and give you a net result where you are. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, the question is, what is the best form of vitamin D to take? Vitamin D3. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, good question. Should you take the dose all at one time or should you divide it? Well, if it is a, a smaller dose, like 2,000 or 4,000, you can take it at the same time. But when it is above 5,000, try to take it twice a day. But if you're gonna forget about the second dose, then you can take all 10,000 in the morning. Yes. Do you know the peel for some apps, what it is? Say that again? The peel for some apps. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. The question is, uh, what is Fosamax? Fosamax is a medicine that is used to treat osteoporosis. But before you get on Fosamax, or even if you are on Fosamax, make sure you have a good dose of vitamin D and your vitamin D level is good. Because Fosamax will not work well if your vitamin D is low. Yes, sir. What if you're on Reclast? Reclast is again another anti osteoporosis drug, and again, it will not work well if you are low in vitamin D. Vitamin D is the most important thing for uh, the health of bone, and we can go in a little more detail if we can. In bone, what happens, there are two cycles happening. One is called bone resorption. Is eating away of bone. Cells come, they eat away bone. And then another kind of cells come and they lay down new bone. It's called bone formation. So bone resorption followed by bone formation. When it comes to bone formation, vitamin D and calcium is extremely important. And bone resorption and bone formation are linked. So if you go low in bone resorption, you go low in bone formation. Most of these drugs, including Fosamax and Reclast, they work by reducing bone resorption. So when you are reducing bone resorption, these drugs also reduce bone formation. And if you are already low in vitamin D, your bone formation really goes down. And I've seen patients on these drugs that their bone density over years go down. And in my book, I've mentioned a couple of cases, and what I found out that these ladies were low in vitamin D. And everyone was scratching their head that they're on fossil bags, and their bone density is going down instead of going up. Why? Because low vitamin D, low bone formation, yes, over a period of time, you're gonna have decrease in bone density. 
What levels should you have it above the vitamin D if you're on Greek acid phosphate? Okay. At least 50 nanograms per ml of water. 50? 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. Yes. Is this something you would recommend? The, uh, lady here is asking question on alandronate. Alandronate is generic name for Fosamax. It's what? Fosamax. That lady asked about Fosamax. Alandronate is generic name for that. The same drug. Yes. And your answer was? My answer is that you should go on vitamin D first. Make sure your vitamin D level is very good. Then have your bone density done in a couple of years. And if that is low, only then go on a land Sure, it does have side effects. Can I summarize? Uh, I just want to summarize for a moment because of the mold in the throat side. Okay, you heard it. So I'm going to summarize it again. As you know, hormone D deficiency is extremely common, and you have to take care of it. You have to take charge of your hormone D deficiency, and that's the reason I wrote this book, and that will answer almost all of your questions. Thank you very much.